Hello everyone, welcome to 345 Tech Talks. Um, I'm Andrew and I'm here with my colleague Andy Norris and we're here to talk about uh, an introduction to performance engineering. So just introducing Andy, I mean, Andy, you're, you're one of our top, top, top uh, technical specialists. So just for just to give everyone a bit of a background, um, you just tell, tell us a little bit about how you got to how you got here in your in your career. What's and then what led you to be, you know, a, a senior architect with a with a with a but with a real skill set performance. Okay. Hi, so I'm Andy Norris, and so to answer your first question, Andrew, um, I, I basically started in IT in the eighties, in the mid eighties, on mainframes. You don't look old. Uh, yeah, I, I certainly feel it. Um, so, and always, on, even on the mainframes, I kind of specialised in, in technical matters um, and performance. And having been on mainframes for about 20 years, so around the, the noughties, um, started to get involved with mainframe applications that were increasingly having more and more um, distributed backends. So I spent about four years um, with a foot, foot in both camps. And then from... 2004, if was solely um, on distributed platforms. So started off with BizTalk. And so a lot yep, of yep. my experience comes from BizTalk running uh, in large scale enterprise applications. Um, and latterly, so from 2010, 11 onwards, um, started to get involved with Azure. So now I've been involved with Azure in over the over pretty much over the last 10 years, but but increasingly um, as a as a primary specialism over the last six years or so. Okay, so so we you know so we talked about about the fact that you've you got into performance quite early, but but really when we talk about performance engineering, we, yeah, what what do we mean? What do we mean by performance engineering as opposed to the other disciplines within within uh, within software? I think for me, largely, it's actually common sense. Um, in, in, in so g going back to the the mainframe days, um, and the common sense around it is that when whenever you deal in IT, whenever you deal with computers, you're actually dealing with finite resources. Yeah. So yeah. as more and more abstraction layers have been added over the years, people tend to forget quite a lot or not be taught about the actual fundamentals of of CPU, I/O, memory, network I/O, um, and disk. And as a result, on the mainframes, um, you had to worry about those things because you were sharing that resource with effectively the entire company that you were working with. So if you wrote an application, or in my case, um, I was supporting the backend platform for all applications, um, if they started to misbehave, if one application started to misbehave quite quickly, um, it would impact the performance of every application running against those shared resources. Um, in the distributed world, we've we've kind of come from a slightly different angle in that um, we've always had, we've always written in the distributed world applications across multiple servers. Yeah. Um, and again, one of the things that was going on back in the day on mainframes, all the way up to effectively the last five or six years, is that Moore's law was keeping us going in terms of just throw more tin at it, more hardware, scale up, and with the the kind of latest advances in in azure to go into commodity hardware and also moore's law now slowing down in terms of just being able to throw a tin at things <laughs> so moore's law is for, for those who can't remember it's is what is it processing speeds double every two years or something is it yeah i forget the, the number of years but but and, but you know so, so certainly for the first 10 15 years of, of of my career that that was that was that was what was happening and also so the number of times that uh, application issues were, were were resolved in the in, in the earlier days of my career just by throwing more tin at it yeah throwing more tin at it is 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 a, is a is a term that we're all very common yeah about. throwing more tin at it and uh, tin is cheap it's, and tin is cheap yeah exactly yeah. but the thing that um again so the other interesting thing in terms of uh, of, of taking it through to performance engineering is of course so, you know, coming from the background, we were dealing with relational databases and relational databases shared amongst a finite number of people and a finite number of users. So again, back in back in the day, so everything for me was around uh, a, a SQL type backend, whether it be DB2 or, 
you know, other databases. Um, and yeah. they, they were using two-phase commit to, to make sure that all of their transactions were, were uh, c committed synchronously. Um, and therefore you, you, you had, you know, either a, a transaction was committed or it wasn't committed, but you knew what the, yeah. what the case was. Um, unfortunately, so what's happened is that so with the with the advent of the internet explosion, is scaling up is no longer the panacea. So the, the two panaceas, are, you know, scaling up and throw more tin at it, no no longer work. And so we're we're increasingly using scale out architectures, yeah. um, and that brings it's, a completely we can still different throw set more of problems. Tin it, but it's it's throw more tin alongside it rather than buy more. Ex yeah, instead of buying a, a more expensive box, it's buy loads more boxes, isn't it? Yeah, which which effectively introduces a whole brand new set of problems, because yeah. now we're so going back to you know an old mainframe application. So the the application was sat on the same tin as the database, and so when the application needed to to commit data or to to look at data, um, it was sat right next to it. Mm -hmm. With distributed systems, especially with internet systems, um, there could be hundreds or even thousands of machines which are now involved with creating, you know, a state against a uh, against a data source. So that brings, you know, quite a different set of problems in terms of making sure that you've got the performance both in throughput and and latency, and really those two things are very separate. Again, I think I think there is a a, a, a view that people think of them as very similar or, or related, but they both have com completely different constraints and completely different patterns that you need to architect against them. So one of the things, just before we get into that, because I think that's that's kind of a deep thing, I just want to go back a little bit to something you said a little bit earlier, and that was about the the resources, because ultimately there are, yeah, you know, with, with 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 computers there are. You only have a certain certain types of resources in it. So, what was it you said? You got CPU, yeah, you've got me memory, yeah, network, and and this guy uh, are the primary ones, yeah. And pretty much, even even now with where we are in, you know, with with all cloud computing, lots sort of stuff, it still boils down to those four things, doesn't it? Absolutely, um, yeah. Uh, and so what what's happened is again. So if you go back to the having the application on the same physical machine as the database. Yeah, that the, the that communication the that communication was was happening within the computer, so you weren't using the network. Yeah. So yes, you needed you know you needed fast SCSI cards or what have you on on, on the on the computer, um, but you weren't actually doing that 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 physical I/O across the network, which of course these days with virtualized computing you are. Yeah, and then when you when you say okay, I'm going to scale out, so you can you can add more servers, so you can get more memory, more CPU. And more disk by adding more servers, but then you've got network between them. Right. So you so you, so you move the bottleneck from you one move, place to another. You move the bottleneck from one place to another. So it's yeah. just you're still trying to you you still got those four things, and you're trying to juggle whereabouts is the is the constraint on those. Absolutely, and, and performance engineering really is just moving the bottleneck from one place to another. It largely it, moving it from an unsafe place to a safe place is is one way of looking at it. Yeah, and, and 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 generally, it's not making things unlimited. It's make it's 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 fixing one bottleneck, then you move on to then another thing becomes the bottleneck. You fix that until you've got enough, right. and, then, yeah. and then and 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 then it's kind of yeah. You know, it's not as if you go on to infinity. It's you 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 fix it enough so that you can do what you need to do. Yeah, because the, again, so even with cloud cloud computing, these these resources are, are expensive. So you've you've got to avoid another important thing to avoid is is over engineering. So you need to engineer enough for the you know the problem domain and where that problem domain is at this particular point in time in in terms of concurrency and user base and latency, but you don't want to make it infinite at the beginning because it will it will basically won't be cost effective as an application. And I think that's some uh, well that that's a whole that whole thing of how do you make things cost effective to run is a whole different thing and we probably haven't got time for that today. So let's just go go back to where we left off and talk about throughput versus latency and what what the difference is and what uh, and and also why you choose one or the other and, and all those the sort of trade-offs involved. So let's so let's talk a bit about well first of all what do we mean by throughput versus latency and then we can and, and and then we can talk a bit about what what scenarios they're important in. 
Yeah, so in very simple terms, so throughput is how many things can you do at the same time? In effect, and, and details on my website or something. Yeah, and, and and latency is how long does each one take? Yeah, and the reason that they're they're separate is that in terms of enterprise patterns, you tend to start falling into different patterns de depending on which thing that you're optimizing for. So pretty much early on in the application design process, you you will have a view as to whether or not the you know the particular problem domain that you're trying to solve is really going to be. Um, a latency based domain or a throughput domain and then you you know in the, in the case of cloud computing you will start right from that point to, to engineer appropriately mm -hmm. and then it goes it goes all the way back to the, the thing i was saying earlier about um, old mainframe systems and two-phase commits so the you know there's a very simple statement that you can make is that synchronous doesn't scale yeah so that you you will look for any synchronous pattern, any synchronous application, it will scale to a certain point, but it will never scale beyond that, especially if you're using databases that require um, effectively, uh, you know, a two phase commit protocol. Yeah. And, and most things, you know, these days, most things end up in a database. Yes, of some kind, a storage, and that's and that's one for me. That's one of the big things that's come along with with you know with cloud computing because quite early on the pioneers of, of true internet scale applications realised this um, and started moving away from synchronous database transactions into towards uh, eventual consistency models, and that brought out a whole plethora of new technology with NoSQL stores, um, yeah. and. You know, so if you if you really prize under the cover as to what the advantage of a NoSQL store is, is it really one of the main ones is that there's, there's no transaction there, or there's no two phase transaction across different resources. Yeah, and and uh, because you can't, yeah, you, you you simply just can't have that level of because when you because when you talk about two k two phase commit, you're saying basically, I'm going to write this bit of data here, I'm going to write this bit of data here. And then you say to everyone, "Is that okay? Is that okay?" And all and everything, you know, everyone has to sort of put their flag up to say it's all right. And then you, and then you write it. And, and during that time, effectively, everything's blocked. Right. Yeah. And when things are quiet, it's okay because you can work around the blocks and that sort of thing. But then when things get busy, you know, one thing gets blocked, and then something's waiting behind that. But then that's blocking something else, and then that's blocking something else, and then suddenly it just all cascades into this whole horrendous mess which is yes. why which is why sort of relational sql although it's great for consistency it's really bad for throughput because you just you reach that point where it just it just all it's like trying to get people through a door isn't it if you want a crowd of people you've got to get through you know, if you've got a crowd of people in the cinema and you've got to get them through one door when they're going in single file it's really easy but then you try to get 10 in a time and then it all just grinds to a halt it's a very similar thing yeah, and so even with relational databases in terms of the cloud, um, and you know, so I guess I specialize mostly in Azure on the cloud and SQL. There are still even with relational databases, there are now um, strategies around solving that particular problem with with sharding. Yeah. Um, and again, so if you go to the NoSQL data stores, that problem again is is largely resolved by sharding the data because they basically got sharding baked in, haven't they? Yes, exactly. They, they were architected with that from the outset. So to give you an, an analogy, it's kind of common sense. So if you've got uh, a row on a table with a number, and yeah. basically you're you're going from, so the number starts at 10 and you're trying to add one to it. If effectively only one of you can be adding one to that number at a time, because otherwise the, the state is, is going to change. Yeah. So, um, and this is the, the the blocking theory that you're, you're talking about. So, you know, so if you've got ten users all trying to add one at a, a time to that number, effectively only one is is really adding to to, to the table or adding change in the row on the table, um, and the others are waiting. So, when you're using scale up technologies, if you make that database run faster, um, effectively they're, they're waiting less time, but they're still waiting. They're still queuing behind yeah. one another. Whereas if, you know, to take a, a kind of sharding example and a very simplified, so if you have five databases um, and each with the same row on the table, so, you know, the users can share each their own copy of the database, but so that they're effectively, they're only queuing against, you know, whoever it is that's against the same copy of the database or partition, if you, if you want to, uh, to take that analogy. Um, 
and so that that reduces things it reduces the, the contention against locking but ultimately you know any kind of locking will be will be a a, a main blocker in terms of um in terms of of, of latency so so okay so what what are the strategies that you might do to solve the to solve the latency issue then so it's really, and this is where it goes all the way back to de, to design. Um, so for, right at the beginning of, 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 of designing. So effectively, so I mean, if we if we keep with the same um, analogy of, you know, you want to add no, a num one to a, a an amount on a on a table somewhere. Yeah. Um, in terms of the the user interface, the API that, that that's that it's attached to. So if you have a user interface that basically says add one and uh, the, the return of that interface is the, the final number, then that has to run synchronously. For you to get that result, it has to run synchronously. So that will start to involve a, a cascading architecture where you've got effectively you're passing that synchronous synchronicity down through all the application layers, all the tiers, all the way down into the data tier. So you'll end up with, you know, effectively an architecture which is synchronous end to end, even though you might have many abstraction layers and, and many different tiers in it. Um, however, if you change that out out uh, outer layer of uh, so you know, so effectively you call an API um with something like a webhook a callback then that means that you can start breaking that down and you can start calling it you can you can you can do a lot more with the abstraction layers that sit behind it so because the application effectively the, the ap the initial api call is 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 going you know yes add a number to to this particular thing and it gets the result straight back again but then later on it's going to get the result back now that can still be near real time. It can still have very low latency. But what that means is you can start to move into other patterns down the application tiers with store and forward technologies. And again, so that means that you can, you know, with with kind of queuing technologies uh, sat behind the the initial API, you can start to fan out and partition and you know so to start breaking down the the issue of of you know the the concurrency um, amongst lots of different uh, you know scale out computes one of the things that's, that, that this is similar to is that when you go and get a coffee right if, if you've been in a coffee shop where you order a coffee and then the barista then goes and makes the coffee and gives it to you and then serves the next person you Great find that there's, there's, there's a queue waiting out the door whereas what one of the things starbucks did was you take they take that they take your order they write it on the cup hand the cup to the next person take your money and then you're done and then later on, you go to the end of the counter and you get your coffee back. And that was so much more scalable because they can, you know, you can have more than one person making the coffees, but but the person on the, you know, the people on the tills can get get those orders taken. You can separate by separating those things out. You've moved it from a, you know, a synchronous problem to like the callback thing, like you say. Yeah, and that, and that's a great analogy. But again, so the thing, and if, if you like, so this is where performance engineering starts to break out into other areas. So because now we, we've kind of we've 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 done the the whole scaling of the data thing, but what you've done by introducing all of those layers, just like you say, so you've got the you know you've got the barista who's who's taking your name and writing it on a cup and handing it on to somewhere else, someone else. Well, that person can now drop the cup, destroy the cup, um, not read the name correctly etc not read the order correctly yeah. so one of the things that you know is which comes with with when you start to get into performance engineering is that and and also with uh, internet scale and also with distributed computing is that the number of failure points that you have in your end-to-end -end transaction starts to explode mm -hmm. and so really performance engineering isn't just around making things go faster um, it's actually making sure that all of those all those failure points that you're introducing actually also have some kind of resolution to them in that the you know the, the, the person so going back to your analogy of, of the uh, of the person in Starbucks if that person never gets their cup of coffee then they're going to be very upset about it whereas when they gave the cup of coffee to the barista who walked over to the machine they were watching that barista fill that coffee cup full of coffee and so they knew at every stage what what was going on with it yeah. So as soon as you start to decouple things, then you introduce by its nature a whole load more failure. 
So one of the rules of thumb that I always go go through um, um, these days is is that so for any kind of given application, probably eighty percent of the code is actually to deal with the the failure scenarios that have been introduced by having all of the the lovely abstraction layers, and actually twenty percent of the code is actually the optimization of of the of the happy path. If you have, yeah, because and that's something that I, I often quote people about as well, and and I think. One of the people, one of the things people are always ask is why is this stuff so hard? Uh, and 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 that, and it's and, and and it's precisely that really. It's the, it's the fact that failure modes are really hard to deal with, and and they can get really complex. And because you 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 know you, when you when you've got a component, a component can only fail in certain ways. When you then then become a distributed system, the interaction between all the things in the system just becomes exponentially more complex. And so you require systems thinking, not component thinking, to make that work. And 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 that's why it's hard. There's no getting around it. You've got to get your brain around the fact that a lot of things could happen, and and a lot of things, a lot of things can happen really unexpectedly as well. So what what are some what what be some examples of some classic kind of issues of of of, of this kind of cause? You know, multiple failure points caused by scaling out. What would be some good examples that? They're non Starbucks related. Yes, yes, that's, 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 that's some very typical ones, uh, and they're the ones that you watch out for all the time. So, um, obviously, so if you've got a handoff to another subsystem of some kind, so that the the first and most obvious problem is, well, what if that system isn't available at all at yeah, the time yeah. that you're calling it? Um, so again, so if you've got a store and forward technology so you know so kind of the optimal pattern will be so your api will will write um the incoming message into some kind of store and forward technology before acknowledging back to the the caller so by having a store and forward technology if the downstream system isn't available immediately then you've still got you know you've still got a message on a queue you've not lost any data you know potentially everyone's everyone's happy you might be going outside the the boundaries of the required latency um, or the throughput that you're seeking, but at least you haven't lost data. So that, that's the most common one. Um, the, the second one is is really around still around transient issues. So you may have a system that's available, um, but it could, itself could be saturated for some for some particular reason. So again, especially if you're making, you know, if you've got a handoff to another system, typically that will be done over a, over a period of time, so there'll be a timeout associated with that handout, and and you know, so apart from the system being not available at all, um, then you might get a timeout. It could take so long to respond that actually you 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 think it's you think it's dead. Exactly. So and, and there you've actually introduced yet another type of failure right right at that point because there if if that is um, that handoff itself potentially. That request had completed successfully, had run to end, yeah, um, yeah. and was on its way back to you, telling you that it completed successfully. When you decided that you're no longer interested in waiting for its response, and you're going to try it again. So, you know, so for example, in banking transactions, if you were to try that operation again, you know, effectively you might be double accounting. So yeah, that's yeah. where you've got whole well, you might, patterns. Well, you might get the money taken out of your account twice. Exactly. So, so, uh, and and uh, and that's where again. So, in terms of patterns, you start to think about things like item potency, making sure that the identifier that you're using to describe the message or or transaction that you're passing be, be between layers um, is the same, so that you know that you can you can kind of track it. It's and again, it's one of one of the common yeah. One of the common things where where you've got lots of different uh, layers is, and, and especially where they're now um, talking to each other asynchronous, is where is my message? Where is my payload? Where you know you've got a lot of decoupled things. How do you have a single pane of glass to actually describe the end-to-end -end journey? So these are all things that you have to design in. Um, going back to other failures, the uh, other classic failure is so you you've taken a um, back to uh, Back to kind of our, our math type, type example, um, very simple one. So if you've got if you're trying to divide something, and the divisor is in the in, in the message that you're you're passing, and that divisor happens to be zero, then basically when that attempts that operation to the next layer down, at some point it's going to go division by failure. 
so you've got the and this is a poison an example of a poison message so you might have a payload which is syntactically correct but yeah. a payload that can never ever be applied and so again that's another very very common failure mode where you've got um, distributed queues um, and you get to and you're you know you might be partitioning those queues as well and you get something that gets to the head and can never be consumed so you have to deal with that as well so that that's in that that happened that, that has two kind of flavors so the first flavor is so how do you get the message out in the first place and mm -hmm. how do you tell the, the caller um that basically they they their message is never going to get processed so you can see and this is one of the reasons why people tend to to go towards synchronous transactions is that they're a lot simpler so you, on one on one side you you've got the fact they don't scale, but on the other side they they're much simpler to deal with. Yeah, because it says do this, and then you either get a yes or no. It's either done or it isn't. Yeah. Rather than the the kind of the Schrodinger's cat thing of of you don't know whether your transactions are dead or alive until until the <laughs> until you open the door at the other side and see what's happened to it. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, that is uh that's great stuff, Andy. So. I think we've we've covered quite a lot of ground. I'm um, just um, so, so I just want to sort of wrap up by just asking really if if there's any if there's any advice you give to people who are you know who've got a performance related problem apart from give you give you a call, uh, which uh, which you probably haven't <laughs> which you'll probably haven't got scale for, but. Uh, but what what would you say to people if they've got performance related problems? What what would the what the what what the sort of what would what what approach would you say that they could just start with that would at least get them a reasonably good a good way down the road? A big a big thing is the repeatability, and and so uh, as you can imagine, so with performance problems and, and you know some of the things that I've I've described, um, they may happen very infrequently and they may be impossible to reproduce easily. So again, all the way back to design, there's there's two key things, which to be honest with you is common sense that applies to any, any application, um, is that you, you need, in terms of testing, you need the repeatability and you need to actually invest in, in testing against these scenarios. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, one of the things that I'm, I'm very strong on is the fact that uh, you, you need test frameworks and you also need performance test environments. So, you know, non-functional testing is also always one of those things, whether it's performance or security that tends to get pushed to the back door. Yeah, Whereas yeah. in reality, the, the, those type of issues hit you very late, quite often when you're in production, and they're actually some of the most costly to um, to resolve. And this is a, this is a, just, just diver picking up on that. I mean, that one of the things that I remember when I first started working in software, we used to, at the time, I was being encouraged to follow the rational unified process which is kind of an early, earliest methodology. And one, you, one of the things you used to say then was um, to tackle your architectural risks first. And then, because, and, and, and perform, you know, verifying your performance is, is addressing your architectural risk because you know, you know functional stuff, you can fix it. But if you can't meet a performance target, if you can't secure your thing, you've got to fundamentally rebuild. And, yeah. and just huge like you say it's hugely expensive to find that at the end so why do people leave it to the end <laughs> it's because it's like yeah, the, exactly. most, the most expensive thing if it doesn't if it, you know if if you if your screen color is the wrong is, is is wrong you can kind of fix that without <laughs> without worrying about it too much if you're clicking a button doesn't work you can fix that quite easily but if it doesn't scale you've you've got to You've you've got a serious problem on your hands, haven't you? And that's it. I mean, so so you know, I've been involved many times with uh, the back end of uh, of you know both the mainframe and distributed, where the customers already got a problem. Yeah. And, yeah. and so therefore, you're, you're you're kind of thrown into an area where you, you've got to then find where the problem is. And the the reality is, unless you've got massive, you know, really good instrumentation, and and you've got really good telemetry, especially where you know you've got lots of different abstraction layers and do lots of different services um, that are all orchestrating with each other, it's very very hard to pinpoint it down. So again, you you just hemorrhage massive amounts of time. So this is really where a lot of the, the thinking needs to be front loaded. So in terms of making sure that you've got telemetry at every single, you know, every single pinch point, 
you've got telemetry that you, you, you gives you a single piece of pane of glass across the entire end-to-end -end journey, which you know may go through many services. Um, and you know, and finally, actually have a way that you can actually take the problem away and test it. You know, one of the analogies that I I always use is that. Um, which has always stuck with, stuck me has always been very useful to me, is that planes don't tend to crash because of a single component failure. You know what really happens is you have a whole cascading set of failures which no one ever imagined or tested, and it's the compound of those failures that actually then then, then create the problem. So if you're flying blind and you don't have that instrumentation and you don't have you've got no way of capturing all the you know the whole end to end journey then the chances of success are always going to be low. Yeah, it's just like it's broken. <laughs> you know, and you just haven't got any idea. And 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 I think there's, well, that's another whole big topic about how you do that, how you do that instrumentation, um, which you might pick up on another time, because that in itself is, I wouldn't say it's hard, but it's it needs thinking about, doesn't it? It, it, it does, because again, you've got to aggregate that data somewhere. So, and that's one of the things. So again, again especially with um, distributed services, that data may be may, may be around, but it might be on. You know, so if you're, if, you know, just silly things. If you're logging to a local server, and you've got a hundred local servers, then at, at, and the message is getting passed around those servers. Again, it's an impossible journey. So you need some way that you can, you know, externalize and aggregate that data to give you a, a useful view. Yeah, and. Uh... Yeah, I think that's definitely a topic for another time because it's a it's a big one. So, um, let's let's wrap up now. And I think we've been going <clears throat> quite a long time. We've done a really good introduction to performance engineering, and we'll drill down in some of the other things um, on on other podcasts. But but thanks a lot for being with us today. So Andy Norris, everyone, this is Andy Norris, performance guru, <laughs> and uh, it's been great having this conversation, Andy. And we'll uh, and thanks everyone for listening. And we'll be back soon. Okay, bye now. Thank you.